During the course of the last century, a revolution in transport has meant that people can travel around the globe far more efficiently and an increase in affluence and leisure time has meant that many people actually participate in this travel in the form of tourism. Tourism has been growing for many decades now and the Australian Government maintains a Tourism Research Australia agency which actually investigates the degree and nature of tourism in Australia. It has clearly shown that many millions of tourists come to this country. For example, in Melbourne in 2013, there were 2 million international visits to that city. In Sydney, there was 3 million international visits. And these numbers approximate the actual number of residents that live in these cities. These figures also exclude domestic travel, which is extremely common and would add substantially to these totals. In terms of Australians travelling overseas, there are many, many thousands of Australians that do this and their primary destinations are the United States of America, New Zealand, uh, China, Fiji and other Pacific Islands, the United Kingdom and Europe, just to name a few. Research that has been commissioned into tourist motivations for visiting Tasmania reveal some interesting trends. Of the six reasons that were cited by tourists for visiting Tasmania, three of them were to do with the environment. These were wilderness and nature, pristine and untouched scenery, and wildlife. And it's this latter motivation that will be the subject of this video. Welcome to Eco and Tourism and Interpretation. My name is Mike Weston, and today I'll be going through a lecture which is all about wildlife and tourism. We'll explore some of the direct impacts of tourism on wildlife and some of the indirect and more insidious or subtle impacts that can occur to our wildlife simply because of our presence in habitats. I'm here on the Gold Coast in southern Queensland on a shoreline that's been radically altered by recreation and tourism. Essentially the entire hinterland is developed. There's virtually no reserve networks on the coast, very, very few. These beaches are managed for recreation and for tourism. If seaweed, beach cast seaweed occurs on these beaches, these beaches are groomed to remove it. That's a source of nutrients for in fauna and the beach ecology. If storms radically alter what is a dynamic coastline or has been for uh, many thousands of years but now is stabilised, then these beaches are nourished. The sand is brought in from elsewhere in order to re-establish the tourism asset, the reason that tourists come to this part of the world. These are examples of direct alteration of wildlife habitat to service tourism. They're pretty obvious and their impacts are pretty obvious as well. Uh, there's very few wildlife on these beaches anymore. They exist in river estuaries uh, and they're at very low densities. However, there's more insidious and subtle impacts that we can explore and which will be the focus of this lecture. The mere presence of human beings often associated with tourism, uh, adventures uh, and uh, businesses are associated with changes in wildlife behaviour and this change in behaviour, physiology, can occur to the extent that it can not only be a welfare problem, but it can also be a conservation problem, a problem which threatens the viability of these species. This is a particular concern because something like 90% of ecotourism adventures uh, and uh, businesses are built around iconic wildlife species, such as, for example, pandas. So, um, a very small number of terrestri largely terrestrial but sometimes marine species are the focus of very intense tourism. So what does this mean for these species? We will explore the issues associated with this, but in this lecture we're also going to explore some of the solutions and see if they measure up, see if they're going to deliver on their promises to really enable sustainable ecotourism which supports local economies, local people, and the, na the natural environments and the biodiversity upon which they depend. I hope you enjoy this lecture. This lecture will focus on the impacts of tourism and recreation on wildlife. These impacts can be classified as direct impacts and indirect impacts. Direct impacts involve mortality, so the death of particular individuals, or destruction or conversion of habitat, such that there is less habitat available and species populations may become less viable. Indirect impacts are more subtle 
they're more insidious. Often we don't know that they're actually occurring, but they can result in a reduction of fitness among wildlife or result in a welfare impact that may ultimately disadvantage or even kill particular individuals or threaten populations. The lecture will also explore conflicts between tourism and wildlife because these are actually not that uncommon. And although in many cases, ecotourism seeks to provide a benefit to wildlife through enhancing local communities and providing an incentive for conservation, often the wildlife and the humans are in conflict, either because the tourism is threatening the viability or the welfare of the wildlife, or indeed in some cases because the wildlife itself is actually dangerous to, to, to tourists. Finally, we will be actually focusing in on Queensland, although we could have chosen any one of a number of tourism case studies, such as swimming with whale sharks, feeding dolphins, or hiking in to experience mountain gorillas or orangutans. On our very backyard in this nation, we have major tourism destinations such as the beaches of Queensland. Uh, we've already demonstrated in this lecture that many millions of people come to this country for tourism, and sometimes we forget that Australia is a major ecotourism and tourism destination. So far, we've only mentioned two of very many potential impacts, direct impacts of tourism on wildlife. There are others. These can include this direct habitat conversion, which I've already mentioned, which can occur on site. So the actual construction of facilities that destroy elements of habitat and almost always have some kind of halo effect around them. Uh, and it can also include off-site impacts. An example of an off-site impact might be the changing water regimes associated with the provision of water supplies for increased tourists in remote uh, and natural areas. Tourism is also associated to some extent with pollution and uh, litter. So with some of this can entangle or damage wildlife. It's even been suggested that tourism uh, is associated with the introduction or spread of pests and diseases. For example, in one case, it's been suggested that large at the great apes such as mountain gorillas might in fact be vulnerable to some human diseases and close encounters between tourists and gorillas might actually transfer disease from the humans to the gorillas and this could be a conservation threat. I'm now here on the Sunshine Coast several hundred kilometres north of the uh, Gold Coast and the uh, strip development of this coastline continues almost unabated. So it's an incredibly uh, extensive area which has actually um, been developed for tourism and essentially is a, is a very substantial tourism infrastructure and an infrastructure to support those who rely heavily on tourism as well. Well, many direct effects of uh, tourism on wildlife in, are particularly obvious, such as habitat destruction. Some of direct effects are actually a little more difficult to detect. Here we are in North Queensland, where there's been massive tourist development and massive tourism visitation rates in the area, for example, around Cairns and the wet tropics. And we have a species called the Southern Cassowary, which is a threatened ratite bird in the same group as emus, is approximately 1.5 metres tall or taller, uh, and is a, is a particularly threatened species. The threatening processes for, for Southern Cassowary are numerous. They involve the fragmentation of their lowland rainforest habitats, catastrophic events such as cyclones, which actually damage their habitat and uh, reduce their population sizes. But another major threat is in actual fact collisions with vehicles on roads. And roads and infrastructure have been promoted by tourism visitation and there are many tourists driving on these roads. And so they contribute to some of the mortality in southern cassowaries. There are, however, a great deal of attempts to prevent this uh, problem from endangering the species any further. It's a great deal of road signage, there's driver awareness. The Queensland State Government maintains a rehabilitation centre for uh, road injured cassowaries, etc. But here we have one instance where there's a particularly subtle and downstream effect of tourism on one wildlife species. There's another type of interaction between vehicles and wildlife that result in direct impacts on wildlife, and that is to do with tourism involving vehicle usage on beaches. In Queensland, 
Many private vehicles are used on beaches to take people to places where they want to go surfing or swimming or fishing. Uh, many tourists use these or hire these vehicles or, or get in guided tours in an individual four-wheel drives in order to access ecotourism locations or places of scenic beauty. There is a, a particularly organised type of this tourism which involves large four-wheel drive buses moving along these beaches and on Fraser Island, the World Heritage Area of Fraser Island, we see many private vehicles used on beaches as well as these large tourist buses that commute up and down legal roads. The beaches are legal roads in Queensland. They're associated with speed limits and these speed limits are enforced by police who use radar guns and speed cameras uh, because so many vehicles utilise these beaches on a daily basis, by day and by night. One of the attractions on Fraser Island is the presence of dingoes, Australia's native dog. Very difficult to see in many parts of the country. They're actually quite prominent uh, on Fraser Island and when you're in a vehicle you can actually approach them quite closely and get a good look at them. This vehicular traffic actually damages the beach form uh, and there's plenty of animals that actually live on this beach which have the potential to be damaged or directly impacted by this vehicular usage, particularly birds as we see here. Some of them are threatened like the beach stone curlew. They're obligate beach birds, they nest and spend their entire life history, life period on the, on the beach, getting all their food resources and their breeding resources from this area. Uh, there are a variety of terns, uh, gulls um, and plovers and other shorebirds that utilise these coasts. Many of them breed using cryptic eggs and are very passive, unobtrusive and hard to detect parental care behaviours such as this red cap plover coming back to its nest to incubate its nest following a disturbance. These birds are particularly difficult to detect even to the trained eye let alone to someone who's driving along at 80 kilometres an hour on the beach. So there are particular uh, direct impacts that can result on these species through collisions and deaths or injury resulting from uh, impacts with vehicles. This disturbing vision of a crested tern was one that we discovered on North Stradbroke Island. This bird is not dead, it appeared to be stunned, possibly dying and this bird had been struck by a vehicle only moments before our research vehicle came along. We don't have actual numbers for the number of birds that are struck or injured in this way, but given the number of birds that we happen across during our research studies in this part of the world, it seems likely that there are substantial numbers. In summary then, direct impacts of recreation and tourism involve direct habitat conversion from high quality habitat to habitats that are lesser quality for many native animals. This involves on-site effects, such as the actual footprint of resorts, roads and associated infrastructure, etc. But there's also off-site impacts, those that can be upstream or distant from the site of actual construction or alteration. And a classic example of these, as we've discussed, is changed river flows uh, but there can be uh, a multitude of, of downstream or off-site effects. Direct impacts also include things like pollution. This can affect wildlife in deleterious ways. And also the introduction or spread of pests and diseases. For example, the spread of buffalo grass around tourist car parks in Central Australia is a major pest problem. We live in a mobile society. We live in a society that uh, has enormous and accessible tools to enable us to travel. And let's face it, one of life's great joys is actually travelling around the globe and seeing new places. And if you have an interest in the natural world or possibly a disinterest in the human cultural world, many of us find ourselves attracted to um, wild places where we can encounter wildlife. And we generally want to encounter that wildlife as closely as possible, as near as we possibly can, and generally in some sort of fairly naturalistic type environment, at least that a lot of ecotourists prefer the more naturalistic type encounters. What this means is that there is a substantial market for taking lots of people into natural and wild places and into the very core 
of the home ranges of, of iconic vertebrates such as gorillas, uh, whales, uh, dolphins, um, uh, some types of birds, etc. And essentially, tourism actually introduces people into habitats where otherwise people would be remarkably rare. This means that um, a series of other processes occur where human beings um, encounter these animals. Imagine that we have an animal and we have an encounter between our animal and a tourist. We call this an encounter, a reasonable proximity between the person and the animal. If an escape behaviour or flight is initiated, we call this distance here the flight initiation distance. And we know that the likelihood and extent or intensity of the response of the animal is inversely proportional to this flight initiation distance. Human beings are generally fairly naive of the responses. We, we are aware of the obvious ones like flying away or swimming away or running away, but there's a lot of uh, subtle responses such as alertness and there's a particular distance uh, at which animals become alert. And um, there's a particular distance above which the animal is not responsive. If an encounter occurs, the animal uses its perception. In this case, I've attempted to draw some kind of uh, vertebrate quadruped. Presumably it has the strongly developed uh, uh, senses such as sight, <coughs> such as smell, such as uh, sensing vibrations in the case of some reptiles, etc. And it needs to perceptively judge firstly the presence of the human being but also then the degree of risk that it actually represents. Once perceived, cognitive processes occur within the animal to make decisions about whether to stay or whether to go. This is a complex arrangement and we understand very little about the subtleties in how animals make decisions about how to respond to human beings. The process whereby the presence of a human alters the physiology or behaviour of an animal is referred to as disturbance. And in the last couple of decades, it's been recognised that disturbance is an important topic to understand if one is interested in animal welfare or animal conservation. When we use the term disturbance, we differentiate it here from the way it's used in much of the ecological literature, where the term describes direct effects on habitats such as fire or tree felling or a, or a stochastic event like a cyclone. Almost all vertebrate wildlife have highly developed and highly uh, adaptive anti-predator strategies. And it's generally considered that responses of wildlife to do the presence of human beings are anti-predator in nature. They take the same form as wildlife responses to actual predators. In this case, we have a kangaroo that's foraging and we can see that although I'm standing relatively close with the camera, and it continues foraging, it is actually remarkably vigilant. It's monitoring me by sight and by its using its hearing to ensure that I don't come any closer or pose a particular risk. For this kangaroo, the consequences of my presence are probably pretty minimal. But in scenarios where wildlife experience highly abundant and highly frequent uh, presence of human beings, and they're very responsive to those um, human beings, then this could represent a problem either at the individual or population levels. In another scenario here at North Stradbroke Island, we have a vehicle approaching a mixed flock of terns, gull build and crested terns. We've already seen that vehicles can kill these birds, and here we see a fairly dramatic flight response upon approach of the vehicles. The terns take flight. Some of these terns are actually feeding young on this beach. They're expending precious energy. Uh, the terns fly away from the vehicle, and in this case, at least many of them resettle at the site. In research that's been conducted on many of these beaches, looking particularly into the effects of vehicles 
on wildlife responses, we see a couple of interesting results. Firstly, we see that there's an effective distance between the vehicle and the wildlife in terms of the likelihood that they will actually take flight or the flush probability. The further away a vehicle is, the less likely flight is to occur. We see this for both cars and buses, but we also note that the responsiveness to buses in this case is much higher than that to cars. There's a different nature of these curves between the two species also, and different wildlife species exhibit different degrees of responsiveness and different responses to the presence of human beings and their transport in their environments. If we look at the intensity with which um, uh, animals are disturbed, and here on this slide we can see a intensity scale where higher levels of intensity are associated with greater levels of responsiveness, and the lower scores around one are result, uh, uh, reflect less responsiveness of the wildlife, we see a number of other uh, factors at work. Once again, we see our difference between crested terns and Australian pied oyster catchers in terms of the intensity of their responses to vehicles. We see that cars are actually generally further away from these birds compared with buses, but we see that the buses evoke more intense responses from both of these species. Studies like this can actually help inform us with respect to what types of human transport and what modes of human presence evoke more or less disturbance from the wildlife that occur in these tourism hotspots.